I'm Dr. Max Gomez and I am at Englewood Hospital. Today we're going to be talking about gastrointestinal cancers or GI cancers. And the most common of those is colorectal cancer. Now colorectal cancer is the second most common cancer in both men and women. More than 140,000 cases are expected this year and 50,000 deaths. The good news though is that many GI cancers and especially colorectal cancer are very treatable and curable. As we're about to hear, early detection significantly improves your chances. But even better, colorectal cancer is often preventable using the same early detection screening methods. Today we'll talk about that screening and diagnosis and what your options are once you've been diagnosed with a GI cancer, from types of surgery to chemo, radiation, and immunotherapy. And to talk about all of that, we have an expert panel. First to my left is Dr. Walter Klein, an internist and gastroenterologist. Then Dr. Minoxi Gower, she's the chief of gastrointestinal oncology. Then Dr. Stephen Brower, who's the medical director of the Left Court Family Cancer Treatment and Wellness Center. And finally, Dr. Anna Sarur, who is chief of colon and rectal surgery. So Dr. Brower, let's start out with you. You're the boss, we're gonna start out with you anyway, so this is a good thing. What First, let's talk about what is considered a GI cancer, a gastrointestinal cancer, because I think most people think anything kind of between here and, and the pelvis is considered gastrointestinal. What qualifies as that? Yeah, so it's really, Max, from the mouth down to where we move our bowels every day, the anus, mm -hmm. and everything in between. And the everything in between encompasses many different organs including the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, uh, the pancreas, the liver. Uh, so it's a variety of organs that support our daily health every day. And when something goes wrong, you can develop a cancer in these organs. We're gonna leave spleen, bladder out of there, kidneys out of there, but almost everything else that, that we call our abdomen or our stomach, as a lot of people call it, qualifies as that, right? For the most part. It's really all the organs that help us to support the daily digestion mm -hmm. of the food that we take in every day. Very common to have cancers in the, in the uh, gastrointestinal tract? Uh, it, is, it is very common. Within our cancer center, the Left Court Family Cancer Treatment and Wellness Center, uh, our most common cancers are cancers like breast cancer, these gastrointestinal cancers, lung cancer, and uh, diseases of the blood as well. So, Dr. Jara, let's talk about the most common, though, is colorectal cancer. It's a big cancer, uh, both in terms of incidence and uh, mortality uh, in this country. Um, why, why is that? We seem to, I mean, that's, that's a big cancer. Uh, it's, what, the second leading cancer killer of men and women in this country? Absolutely, and there are probably 106,000 patients that are diagnosed every year. And what's interesting is that we see a drift towards the younger age group. And that really goes to the question of what drives it. Mm. So generally for any cancer's growth, there's going to be two factors that promote it. One is a genetic predisposition. You're born with a specific abnormality or mutation that you inherited from the family. And the second is an environmental factor. And that could be diet, exercise, pollutants, could be one of many things that we still don't quite understand. But the combination of those in some people sets off the cancer. So I've heard it described as genetics is, uh, it, it's a loaded gun, but you still need a trigger, something to pull the trigger rather. Um, and that could be, as you said, environment, lifestyle, a variety of, uh, of other things. And we just don't know what that, what that is. Do we know some, some of the, uh, those risk factors? I mean, the, the classic risk factors that are outlined for most cancers are, you know, um, high meat intake for people with colorectal cancer, smoking across the board for a lot of cancers, um, high alcohol intake for, you know, several of the cancers. But, but there's not a clear, clear, you know, link per se with some of these. Um, there are people who have inflammatory or abnormalities in the gut, like Crohn's disease mm -hmm. and other sorts mm -hmm. of colitis. And those patients tend to be more predisposed to cancers developing earlier. Dr. Klein, tell me now, 
One of the things that we hear is that Americans don't poop enough. They don't move their bowels enough, and that may be a contributing factor because we really don't get enough fiber to keep things moving through. It's, it, is, it is actually um, true to a degree. The question, of course, is what is the role of fiber in, in, in your diet as well as in the prevention of colorectal cancer and other illnesses? And I, I think there's, there's several different factors. Um, you know, you can say, well, why is it that Americans, you know, get colon cancer so much more often than, say, someone who lives in the Kalahari Desert that perhaps lives on a much different, higher fiber, lower, you know, protein diet? Their stools are larger. They, they have a much lower incidence of colon cancer. And yet, if you move to the United States and you eat a Western diet, either here or Western Europe, you get a higher incidence of colon cancer. And there's, there's several different factors that go with that bowel movements perhaps being one of them. But the other part of it might be the microbiome as well, you know, which is so influenced by all of the antibiotics and, and the other additives and um, pollutants, you could say, that are in our, our, our food supply as well as just in general. But you're going to have to define microbiome for me. The microbiome specifically is uh, the, the variety of bacteria that live within us. Um, we have many, many different types of bacteria that normally reside in our gut from the time we're born to the time, you know, we die. Mm -hmm. And it is influenced heavily by the antibiotics we take. It's influenced by other things that are in the food chain that we may not even take the antibiotics. They may be other additives that, that, that the animals, for example, are eating or the various things that are used on the crops. So that in itself is not necessarily pooping enough or not pooping enough, but it certainly affects the, the stool quality because half of our stool is actually bacteria. So Dr. Jauer, with colorectal cancer, as with probably most cancers, early detection makes a big difference. Tell me about early detection when it comes to colorectal cancer, and then I want to talk a little bit about how this early detection may actually also be preventative, but tell me a little bit about what that means. So the standard guidelines across the world, and I'm sure Dr. Klein will speak more to it, was that at age 50, anyone with no family history per se, or who has an average risk should have a screening colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the years, it's become a much easier and rapid test to do than it was in the previous years. So, you know, patients tend to have a little phobia about the test, but it's, it's really evolved to be something that's crucial to finding a little polyp, a little lesion, which would then, over five to ten years, have become cancer. So if you take it out, you don't have a chance that it would really evolve and become cancer. Uh, people who have, uh, we understand, African-American descent or a strong family history actually have colonoscopies much earlier. And that age can vary based on their predis you know, predisposed risk factors, from anywhere from 35 to 45 for their first screening colonoscopy. And um, I think these are things that we are learning and picking up over the last few years at how important it is to get patients screened for their, their initial colonoscopy. Um, to improve their overall outcome because once cancer is identified in the colon in an early stage, it's almost 80 to 90 percent cured uh, versus when you find it at a later stage when it's spread into the lymph nodes or a distant organ, then the prognosis changes. With these diseases, in order to do right for the patient, we have to formulate the right teams. Mm -hmm. And what you're hearing here are four experts who have particular areas of expertise and come together to make the best recommendations for the patients. So for instance, for Dr. Jower and myself, it's probably therapeutics and, and, and you know, I innovative treatments, although as you can hear, she's fully uh, 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 understanding of the risk. But in terms of this screening piece that you're trying to, that's where the gastroenterologist and Dr. Mm -hmm. Klein and his colleagues really are seeing these patients every day and we want our primary care doctors, the local family doctor, to know when they need to seek the expertise of someone like Walter Klein. So this is exactly what, what I wanted to make sure that, that um, people grasp is a screening colonoscopy is partly early detection, not unlike say a mammogram for breast cancer, but it's really, it can also be preventative, and I don't know that enough people understand that, that with a colonoscopy, you may actually be able to 
prevent colon cancer. Tell me how that works. Yeah, colonoscopy is the single best test available out of a number of different tests uh, for screening purposes for colon polyps and colon cancer. Um, and at the same time, it also can be therapeutic in the sense that if you find a polyp at that point, you can remove it. And by removing the polyp, you reduce the risk of it becoming a colon cancer in the future. I mean, the this is a benign at the time. A it's benign, removed, polyp. It's benign polyp. I mean, the the important point is that not all polyps become colon cancer. The problem is you don't know which ones will. Sure. If you have a one in three chance of developing polyps in your lifetime, you have a one in twenty chance of developing colon cancer for the average person of average risk. On the other hand, as Dr. Jarrow was mentioning, there are special populations of people, mm -hmm. family history of colon cancer, especially in a first degree relative. Those people have a one in five or 20% lifetime risk of colon cancer. So it's even more imperative that you get a colonoscopy earlier and regularly in that instance. There are other screening tests available. So mm -hmm. to say that colonoscopy is the only thing out there would not be fair. There are other options, some of which are um, approach the same efficacy in terms of screening and detection of colon polyps and colon cancer and others which are available as secondary options. Um, but in general, the best thing to do is to start a baseline colonoscopy at age 50. The, the current standard of care is to do a colonoscopy every 10 years. If you have higher other risk factors, mm -hmm. first degree relative with colon cancer, personal history of one or two colon polyps, then you would go every five years for a follow-up colonoscopy. If you had three to 10 polyps on a colonoscopy, mm -hmm. your subsequent colonoscopy would be in three years. And again, if there's other circumstances, you may start at an earlier age, especially if you have a strong family history of colon cancer or related cancers for some of the special cancer syndromes that exist. Dr. Brower, since your title includes a wellness center and having these kinds of uh, screening tests clearly are part of early detection and, and staying well, we hear all the time that people avoid colonoscopy primarily because of the prep. Is there, how do you talk to families and get them to understand that it's not as bad as it seems and how important it is? Well, the first thing I tell them is that I've probably had more colonoscopies than they've had and gone through preps as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, my doctor is sitting right, right there, so I'm in good hands. But, um, uh, you know, it's a matter of people understanding that there are very few cancers or potential for developing cancer that are as easily found mm -hmm. as a colon polyp that may relate to a cancer. It's like skin cancer. No one should ever be developed with a skin cancer that is anything but in the very earliest stages because it's so easily examined by experts. It's out there in the open. It's the same with colonoscopy. It's, uh, yes, the prep uh, is what it is. There are various preparations. The gastroenterologists are very familiar with what type of preparation is, is best for each patient. And I'll let, again, Walter talk about it. but. You know, at the end of all of this, it's a 10 minute procedure that can save a life. It's a brief 10 to 15 minute procedure and you wake up afterwards and you're as good as new and you can go off and have, you know, a good meal somewhere. Um, and that's, that's, that by far is, is the norm for, for most individuals. I mean, if people decide they still can't do colonoscopy, there are other options. I mean, there's CT colonography, right. which is still going to require a prep. It's a, it's a three- So-called virtual it's a virtual colonoscopy. It's a three-dimensional CAT scan of your colon, mm -hmm. which can detect polyps. In a center such as Englewood Hospital, we have a very, very high quality facility that um, it can detect polyps. The only catch is, if you find the polyp, you, you still, need the colonoscopy. Right. For some people, the prior standard of care was to do something called a flexible sigmoidoscopy. And in fact, if you look at the US um, Health Preventive Task Force recommendations, they do say that you could do flexible sigmoidoscopies as, as an alternative to colonoscopy. However, tell me what the difference is between those. The difference is that you're missing about two thirds to three quarters of the colon in an examination so, just of the rectum and sigmoid with a flexible scope going in through the rectum while you're awake. And that's only a short distance. Only a short distance, perhaps this far, as opposed to this far. You know, the average colon <laughs> is about five or six feet. 
the average sigmoid and rectum is probably about that much, mm. 30 centimeters or 40 centimeters or so. So it's useful, but it does miss the patient who has a right-sided colon cancer entirely until it's far more advanced. Let's talk surgery first here now, okay? So Dr. Sewer, from Dr. Klein, who's done a colonoscopy, taken out a polyp, looks like it's cancerous, usually you're the next stop for a patient? Absolutely. So what, how do you counsel them? What do you tell them? So when the patients come in, I counsel them as I would my family member. And I see them first, I examine them, I look at all the records they bring to me, and then we have a sit down in my office and we talk about colon cancer, we talk about staging, we talk about how we approach cancer, uh, in general, what the standards of care are and what really the right uh, treatment for that particular patient is. Because not, the bill doesn't fit all not equally. Not one size doesn't fit all. That's right. What do they mostly want to know when it comes to surgery? What are they most concerned about? Am I gonna live? Am I gonna live a normal life? So those are the two major questions that we try to answer correctly and get them to the normal state of life as soon as possible. I've dealt with a lot of colon cancer patients and survivors and they always said that one of their concerns was, will I need a bag? But that's not the case uh, as much as it used to be, is that correct? Well, there's still a lot of questions to that extent. A lot of patients are misinformed and think that they would need a colostomy or an ileostomy, but fortunately, less than 5% of patients require that. Hmm. What's, what's changed, better surgical techniques or earlier diagnosis, or what, what makes the difference? So definitely early diagnosis is one, but more so the surgical techniques have changed and what we considered an adequate margin in the past uh, has decreased, so we're able to do the most complex operations lower down into the pelvis and reconnect them and restore normal um, bowel function. And one of the things also that I, uh, has changed a lot, it used to be a very large open procedure pretty much all the time, but now it's evolved that you can actually do a lot of colon cancer surgery uh, laparoscopically. So we actually, um, I do about 90% of my surgeries either robotically or laparoscopically, so through very small incisions. Um, not everybody around the country does that. It really has been a very slow adoption of laparoscopic technique, but they have been found to be equivalent to open surgery. We would, otherwise, we wouldn't be doing it. Um, we can achieve the same or even better outcomes with minimally invasive surgery and return the patients to normal health quicker. What's the difference then in terms of, why is that better? Why is doing it laparoscopically or robotically better? It's uh, better in terms of um, cosmetics, obviously, but once somebody has cancer, nobody cares about cosmetics as much. Uh, but it is better physiologically and uh, in terms of pain threshold or pain uh, for the patients. So when you have an open incision, the pain prevents you from moving around, from taking deep breaths, from walking around or eating uh, right away after the surgery, as opposed to when you have small incisions, it's much easier to control the pain and leads to less uh, pneumonia, less uh, fevers, less ileus, which is a slowdown of the intestine. Mm -hmm. So faster recovery, fewer complications. Yes. Okay, good. So Dr. Jauer, now, Dr. Sorer has taken out the tumor and uh, part of the colon. Um, presumably it goes to pathology and they take a look at it. So what happens next? Where do you come in in terms of deciding what happens after surgery? So as a medical oncologist, the key aspect of this is staging um, the patient because that's what determines what the next steps would be. Mm -hmm. So in colon cancer, the stage as in, with any cancer goes from um, zero to four and we can go through some of those to kind of understand where I have an active role and where we just watch those patients. So in stage zero, it's a precancerous polyp and generally removing the polyp is all you need to do. Um, in stage one, uh, the tumor has gone through part of the wall of the colon, but has gone through and through the wall. Okay. 
And colon cancer is different in the staging from lung and breast because in those other diseases, it's the size of the tumor. In colon, it's the depth of invasion through the wall. Mm -hmm. So in stage one, after Dr. Swar has done the surgery, um, that's it, they have a 95% chance of cure and those patients are just watched closely with colonoscopies and don't actively get any chemotherapy. Um, in stage two, when it's gone through the deeper part of the wall, we can actually do very sophisticated molecular testing on the tumor to determine whether that stage two is high risk or low risk. So those high risk stage two patients, we then give chemotherapy because that's making sure that if there were any little cells that had seeded out in the blood, uh, that we would attack them with the chemotherapy and prevent them from growing in the liver or the lung or a distant organ. Mm -hmm. And the low risk patients we treat as stage one because they don't need to be uh, given the chemotherapy. The benefit with chemotherapy is minimal compared to the toxicity in that patient group. So although I'm a medical oncologist, I think the key is the art of understanding which patients should get chemotherapy and which patients shouldn't. Mm. And then there's stage three when it's involved the next step, which is the lymph nodes. We all have lymph nodes in our body. Um, and you know, when we have surgery from uh, expert surgeons at Englewood, we harvest a good number of lymph nodes, which we want to see because that's your denominator. You want to make sure that enough lymph nodes were removed at your surgical procedure to study it. Um, because even if one had cancer cells, that puts you at stage three. Mm -hmm. So that changes the stage. But if you didn't have enough lymph nodes removed, you wouldn't have the correct stage. You may not have found that, exactly. that handful of cells. And so those patients then benefit significantly with chemotherapy for a period of three to six months. And that varies mm. based on the stage. That's an evolving answer is the length of treatment. But for the WASP part, it's like a six month chemotherapy course. Mm. And the stage fours are a little bit more complicated. And again, those are the ones we discuss with our surgeon, our surgical colleagues. Uh, including, you know, some of our liver specialists like Dr. Brower and radiation. This is stage four is the cancer has spread to other organs. To a distant organ, mm -hmm. which could be lung, liver, lymph nodes. Those tend to be the most common sites that colon cancer spreads to. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about that, but let me go back to, to Dr. Brower here, because clearly you've assembled a really top-notch team here. And the question that I'm sure you hear so many times and so often is, well, I've been diagnosed with, you know, I saw Dr. Klein and he, I've got colon cancer. Should I go to New York City to get treated there? Or what's the value here of, of being treated here at Englewood Hospital? Yeah, it's a very, very important question. The answer is I was sitting here quietly marveling at the very specific expertise that each one of these team members brings to the table. And although it seems as if this is a somewhat um, staged area where we're all sitting together and I'm in, sitting with my colleagues in a very, you know, calm, lovely area, I want to tell you, Max, and everyone else, that we talk to each other like this every day. Mm -hmm. My office is feet away from Dr. Sarar, Dr. Jower, and Dr. Klein. So... Any patient that comes to our cancer center, um, we don't ask the doctors to try to make uh, an understanding of the disease recommendations on their own. They're each capable of it. But the reason they come to work here and practice here is because this cancer center under one roof allows us all to render a recommendation to the patient that has you know, upwards of 20 individuals at the top of their game with each aspect of colon cancer rendering the decision. So the short answer to your question is any patient should strive to get as much information beforehand making a decision. Any doctor who is responsible for these patients should assist that patient in getting as much information. I can tell you from having practice in the city that you referenced for 20 years and having had individuals come to me, perhaps from other places, the opinion that they're getting here is absolutely no different. The, and, and, and what is the added piece with the opinion here 
is that I think it's given in a much more compassionate, um, face-to-face manner where the relationship with each of these doctors and their patients, I view it every day, is a very, very unique uh, um, experience and we're all honored to have that responsibility. And there's a tremendous value, isn't there, to staying in your community, surrounded by your, your support system, uh, your family, other people. Uh, there's a value to that that it's kind of hard to, to quantify, no? Sure, that's embraced in the entire mission of Englewood Hospital and Medical Center, where our first responsibility is to our community and keeping our patients uh, uh, with their families, although we get patients from all over the country. I, I just want to add something. Sure. You know, I, I grew up in this area, so I've, I've seen the growth of Englewood Hospital, you know, throughout my, most of my life. And I, I've been in practice here for the past 26 years. So I've been, you know, tr I had training at, at many, you know, great institutions in New York and in Philadelphia. And one of the things I can definitely say both as um, you know, the family member of people who've come here, uh, f uh, the friend of patients who've come here, as well as myself, that the level of care here is very, very good. The, the amount of training that the physicians themselves have received here is on par with any institution in Boston, New York, you name the, you name the medical center. And most of the doctors who are here now at Englewood Hospital were trained in those institutions and could have very easily stayed there as academicians. Dr. Schroer, let me come back to you with a question, which is um, what I find a lot of times people think that one size fits all and they hear robotic or laparoscopic and they say, that's what I want kind of regardless. But you have to make that judgment call as to what is an appropriate procedure for that individual patient. How do you decide which is which? That's an excellent question. That's the question that the patients all very often ask me. Um, my answer is always, I'm not a cowboy. I do what's right for you, not what's right for somebody else in the, in the community or for myself. So what, I'm, what I base my decision is, how can I provide the, ba the best possible surgery with the best possible outcome. And the outcome really has to do with twofold, curing the patient of cancer and restoring normal function. So if that's possible robotically or laparoscopically, then I offer the patient that, that particular surgery. So Dr. Jara, let's talk about immunotherapy, which is a really exciting uh, area of, of cancer research now. The idea being that we can use the body's own immune system to attack the cancer. How does that work? So, so essentially these are specific targeted drugs that make your body's immune system revved up to fight the cancer cells. And there are several of these drugs now out uh, in approval process and getting you know, FDA approval rapidly. Um, there's been one that's actively approved for a specific cohort of colon cancer, which is uh, like Lynch-like syndrome or patients who have a higher mutation burden or have specific mutations. So, so the more mutations you have or the more aggressive that cancer is specifically, um, there's more likelihood that the immune therapy will work in those patients. So, so it's almost tumor agnostic in a lot of ways, we call it, because it's based on the actual, it's not really, the immunotherapy doesn't necessarily work in specific cancers across the board, but it works in places where there's higher mutation burden, a specific molecular pattern. Dr. Klein, put the whole lifestyle picture together for me, nutrition, exercise, um, some supplementary things like aspirin that, that we were talking about. I would summarize that for me, that, that what you would tell a patient about lifestyle and how that's important for colorectal cancer or GI cancers in general. I think that, you know, that's, a, that's a, a very important part of what a patient can do in his or her daily life. And it starts with, uh, you know, trying to take care of themselves holistically and eating sensibly, not overeating not trying to reduce excess weight, which, you know, obesity is, is an epidemic in this country. Trying and a to, major risk factor. For multiple things, including colorectal cancer. Trying to change what we eat, 
to some degree would, would be very helpful. Also, reducing the amount of red meat that we eat, trying to eat more vegetables, and you know, trying to eat more fiber in your diet. Um, the exercise portion is important for many reasons. Holistically, just because people are happier and healthier if they exercise, but specifically, it does help with gut function. Dr. Brower, I'm gonna give you the last word here. This is, by all accounts, a very interesting and exciting time in cancer research, cancer therapy. It's a hopeful time in, in many ways because I think people thought that you know the C word meant it was the end. Not necessarily the case. This is a really important time. We've got more survivors than ever. Tell me. Well, first of all, Max, on behalf of our cancer center, we want to all thank you for the work you've done over many, many years to communicate to the public about prevention and screening and treatment. And uh, that helps to make our jobs very much easier. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm so proud every day of the hundreds of people who come to this cancer center to work to try to either cure cancer or help people that have cancer improve their daily lives. And the one word that we haven't spoken about is survivorship, being a survivor of cancer. And I want to let everyone know that the, the news is very good and optimistic. In the United States alone, there are 14 million people who are survivors of cancer. That's a staggering number. In the next 10 years, it may increase by 50%. So we as a cancer center are not only interested in the prevention, screening, treatment, but in a whole new field that has arisen. It's survivorship. And it's how to support patients and their families who have been cured or are living with cancer uh, throughout their, their whole odyssey. You know, when I first started as a cancer surgeon, um, maybe one out of three patients were alive at five years, so all different type of cancers, We're not just talking colon. Today, two out of three patients who have cancer are surviving this at five years. So it's extraordinary advances, and it's advances that occur because patients are so brave and they want to explore the appropriate options and they want to get involved in clinical trials and research to improve cancer. And that's what our cancer center stands for, uh, supporting these patients and recognizing their survivorship as well. Exactly. Well said. Well, thank you. I think as you've heard from our panel and from uh, Dr. Brower just now, this is an incredibly exciting and hopeful time in cancer research, cancer therapy, cancer treatment, and not just because many more patients are surviving, but they're surviving and living full, satisfying lives. They will live for many, many years as essentially normal people. And that's what's exciting, and that's what is so important for everyone to know, and that's what I think our panel got across to us today. So thank you all for your help today, and thank you.